Hi, welcome back. Uh, this is week five of our course on philosophy, on Marxist philosophy, I should say. And this week we'll be discussing the law of the transformation of quantity into quality, which is extremely important for Marxist philosophy. Now, we've discussed up to now that everything changes and that Marxist philosophy is all about understanding the fact that everything changes. However, that by itself doesn't really tell us very much. It's necessary to understand how and why things change. Uh, and actually, it's a bit one-sided just to assert that everything changes, because, in fact, uh, that's not really true. And after all, dialectics is all about understanding opposites and the, the necessity of opposites, and therefore just clinging to one side of opposites, such as change, uh, is always going to end up being one-sided and ultimately false. And this problem was understood by a pupil of Heraclitus. Um, now Heraclitus is an ancient Greek philosopher and he is really the father of dialectics and he built his whole philosophy around the idea of change, that everything changes, and that is the essence of all things. In fact, he's so important that Hegel actually said, and I quote, there is no proposition of Heraclitus which I have not adopted in my logic. Now Heraclitus famously stated that you can never step into the same stream twice, meaning that the, st the stream will always have changed the next time you come to step into it, and thus it isn't really the same stream. According to Aristotle, one of his pupils took this further and kind of absurdly said, well, actually you can never even step into a stream once because in fact, it's already changed. Uh, there is no such thing as a stream or anything for that matter, because everything that you can think of has always already changed, become something completely different. Now, this seems like an obviously absurd thing to say. And why would he say this? And what's the meaning of it? And how do we answer it? Uh, well, the truth is that this, well, this reveals the fact that just asserting that things change is actually a bit one-sided, because actually things don't just change. They do also stay the same. Um, and uh, yeah, everything everything stays the same because um, if they didn't stay the same, of course, as this example shows, it would be everything would have already fallen apart. For anything to exist, it means it must sustain certain qualities, right? It must sustain a quality of being, you know, for example, in the case of a stream coming from a certain source, flowing to a certain mouth, you know, and obviously having water. Um, and things must, for anything to exist, they must sustain certain qualities such as that over a period of time. Um, and, and therefore things, you can actually say that everything stays the same. For anything to exist, it must stay the same, it must have a certain conservatism to it, if you like. Um, and yet we also know, of course, that everything does change. That is absolutely fundamental. So... We need a bridge, essentially, a category of dialectical logic which serves as a bridge between stasis and change and explains how the one becomes the other, rather than for us just to be stuck in the assertion of one and, and not the other. Um, and this problem of how we explain something going from being one thing to then suddenly being a different thing is a very important one for philosophy, and it is expressed in a couple of famous examples, such as the, the heap of grain and uh, the bald man, in which, for to take the example of the bald man, you are, in this hypothetical scenario, you are plucking hairs off someone's head, who obviously is not bald, but eventually, if you keep on doing that, they will obviously become bald. Now, how do we dis determine at what point they've become bald, and why is that the case? Um, and the same for a heap of a heap of grain, you, if you start out with just one grain, then obviously that's not a heap. If you add another one, it's still not a heap. But at a certain point, it becomes what you would call a heap. Uh, and how? why is that? And, and how does that change take place? This is a deep philosophical problem, which has you know, um, bamboozled philosophers for th literally thousands of years. And I think that the, the law of the transformation of quantity and quality is really the answer to this problem. And it provides this bridge between stasis and change and is therefore extremely useful and important. Um, I would go so far as to say that all change ultimately takes place uh, in some way through this law. You cannot understand change ultimately without understanding this law.
And it's such a widespread phenomena. Uh, in fact, it, like I said, it applies everywhere that it is expressed in several famous idioms, such as, uh, you know, the straw that broke the camel's back or um, something being more than the sum of its parts. The basis for this is the fact that all things are organised. Any phenomena, be it a, a state of affairs or a particular object, they are composed of parts which are self-organised, which stand in definite relations to one another. So the parts of something are not indifferent to one another, right? They're not just sort of like, um, you know, blocks of wood in a bag jumbling about, but they have definite relations to, towards one another. Um, now take the classic example of a body of water uh, and, and alternatively ice. Now these are made up of the exact same parts, clearly, and yet they're totally different. In fact, ice really has, in many respects, far more in common than it, it does with, with other solids, such as, I don't know, a rock, than it does with uh, its, itself when it is in liquid form. You know, solid ice and liquid water completely different in terms of the way they behave, and yet they're made of the exact same stuff. So this shows that the, the character of the inner relations of something is absolutely essential to understanding the overall quality that it has, the way in which it behaves, and there, hence the phrase, more than the sum of its parts. So organisation is absolutely vital to understanding uh, any given phenomena. And this is also understood by and well expressed by a statement, a famous quotation from Napoleon discussing his army. And he says the following. Two Mamelukes were undoubtedly more than a match for three Frenchmen. 100 Mamelukes were equal to 100 Frenchmen. 300 Frenchmen could generally beat 300 Mamelukes. And 1,000 Frenchmen invariably defeated 1,500 Mamelukes. And essentially what he's saying is that even if the, the individual parts of one army, in other words, the soldiers, are more skillful than another, if the other one is better organised, then once you have enough of them, in, in, in other words, it's not just one v one, but once you have hundreds or thousands, then that organisation will ultimately count and it will be what causes victory. Um, so yes, organisation is absolutely fundamental to understanding and the self-relation of, of the parts of something, if you like, is absolutely fundamental. And I'd like to point out how this differs from two mistakes, if you like, of, of thought, which you find particularly in science, but also in philosophy. One would be gradualism, which um, is basically the, the sort of assumption, it's usually an assumption, but not usually actually uh, stated, but the assumption that uh, all change takes place just constantly in, in a linear way. In other words, just a sort of step by step, drip, drip, drip of change, uh, rather than going through leaps and then you know periods of stasis. Um, that's one idea, and and that often crops up in in science or in people who study um, society. And I'll give give an example of that in a moment. Um, one example from science is, is is Darwin, who of course was a genius, but he his original idea of, of evolution was that it was just constant change rather than being animals being settled on set, set species for a long period of time before um, much more rapid periods of, 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 of evolution. Uh, but another related mistake that is very common, I think, in science, in, especially like in the bourgeois mindset of science that you have, is, um, is reductionism. Reductionism essentially treats the parts of something as indifferent to one another. It reduces things down just to their parts. Um, now, again, it's not usually explicitly stated that that's what they're saying, but it, it's, it, it is implied in, in how they understand things. Um, and the problem with this is really expressed in, in, uh, with Heraclitus's pupil's point, which is that if all things change constantly, then how do you explain... Um, the definite, the different definite qualities that things have, and how do you explain if, if all things are just made up of their parts that aren't in definite relations to one another that form definite qualities? Then how do you explain the phenomena of these these qualities in in society, in nature? Um, so with reductionism, a famous example with reductionism is biological determinism which is still quite common, I think. Um, and what it basically attempts to do is to explain human nature, to reduce human behaviour 
to just the genes that make us up. So it, it appears on the surface to be very scientific, very materialist, because it's saying that we're caused by our genes. And you'll sometimes hear this, you'll see, maybe you'll see like an article um, in the in the news or, or in, in a newspaper that says, oh, they've scientists think they've discovered the gene for theft, you know. Um, and once we've found that, maybe then we can sort that problem out by eliminating that gene or something. Now, this is absurd and completely unscientific, in fact, um, precisely because it reduces us to our parts without understanding the relations in which they stand. Uh, genes, of course, do not code for specific behaviours generally. Like you don't have one gene for specifically for a very specific behaviour that just sort of stands in isolation from all other genes. In reality, genes obviously code not for behaviour but for how to build our body, uh, and then our behaviour is an expression once a whole body is built of the mutual interaction of all of the parts of our body, and not only that but ultimately the interaction of our bodies as a whole with society and the general environment in which we live. And that's the only way to explain behaviour. It's not, of course, the, the, the fundamental basis for this is our genes. Without that, we wouldn't even exist. But nevertheless, you cannot reduce these things and, and, and understand them by doing that. Um, and this mistake is unfortunately extremely common. Um, Marxists are sometimes accused of being it through our economic determinism, as people see it. But that is, I don't have time to go into that, but that is um, a, a caricature of Marxism. In fact, dialectical philosophy, dialectical materialism, uh, really explains why reductionism is false and what the real alternative to it is. Um, <clears throat> this also helps us to understand that the problem, once again, of the heap uh, of grain, uh, the idea that things are internally related well, if that's the case, then the reason a heap emerges as a quality of so many grains is because they stand in relations to one another. And when there is enough of them, uh, those relations produce that overall quality. Similarly, with liquidity or wetness, you know, uh, a, a body of water or any other liquid is, you would call it wet, but you can't find that quality in any one of its molecules, even though it is made up of nothing but those molecules. So, that, does that mean it sort of somehow comes from outside of the body of water, some sort of spiritual force, which, of course, some philosophers in the past would have argued? No, it, it is thoroughly based on those parts, but on in the relations of those parts. Um, <clears throat> so anyway, um, we have to come back to this idea of quantity and quality because I haven't fully finished uh, describing that. This, as I said, explains how change takes place. Now, it is true that change is happening all the time. However, most of the change that takes place is not sufficient to alter the overall qualities, which, as I've said, are a product of the relations of the parts. Um, to, again, to go back to our example of a body of water, um, it works because it's very simple and we understand water quite well. Um, so the quality of, let's say, liquidity uh, of liquid water is more or less identical between the temperatures of, of like 0 0.1 degrees Celsius and 99.9 .9 degrees Celsius. Of course, you know, the, the, the water will feel more hot or cold, but ultimately it is a liquid and it behaves as a liquid within that spectrum. So no matter how much you add or subtract temperature, it remains qualitatively fundamentally the same. But at certain points, you know, in other words, at 0 and at 100 degrees Celsius, the quantity of heat energy is sufficient or insufficient to hold it in that set of relations, if you like. And that specific set of relations is burst asunder. Uh, new relations are now created. And that gives rise to a very different uh, quality overall. And that's what we call quantity transforming into quality. There's, an, there's sufficient of a, of a quality to change the, the overall quality. And until that point is reached, the quality stays more or less the same. Um, and this, I would say, as I said, it, 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 it is across nature, this law holds, and, and society. And I'll come on to that in a moment. Um, but uh, the, the last thing I want to say about this is that this also helps us to grasp that change can be very sudden. Um, that qualitative changes can appear as if they come out of nowhere. To give an example of a strike or a revolution, um, it can, you know, be... be understood by most people that there's not that you know everything's normal everything's staying the same you know nothing is 
you know, there's not going to be a revolution or anything weird like that. And then suddenly a strike or a revolution can take place quite often as a result of a fairly incidental thing. Uh, to give a relatively recent example, the Tunisian revolution was sparked by um, a man setting himself on fire in protest at basically being um, unable to sell fruit and being punished by the police for doing so. Uh, but people were doing that all the time in Tunisia and many other similar countries for a long time. Why exactly at that point that enraged people so much that it created a revolution? Of course, we can't know the details. But what we can know is that that obviously was not just a, a completely random or bizarre thing that happened, but it, ex it, it somehow, in the eyes of Tunisians, it expressed the, the, the enormous discontent and the injustice of society. And it was enough for them to feel that they had to do something. And then, of course, that takes on a logic of its own and, and it changes history. Um, and this brings me on to the political value of this kind of discussion. We don't have these discussions just because they're interesting um, or because it allows us to understand uh, certain scientific questions, but also because it makes us better revolutionaries. Um, you know, we have to have the long view of history. You know, we can't... Uh, Marxists are not fighting for this or that reform or just to make this or that country a bit better for a while. We are fighting to change human history, to really liberate humanity from capitalism and from class society in general. So that's a rather uh, large undertaking, clearly. And if we, have, if we allow ourselves prejudices, um, if we allow ourselves to be you know, uh, distracted or to be seduced by apparent shortcuts to victory that in reality and, uh, are actually going to be disastrous. If we do that, then, you know, we, we, we will fail ultimately. And um, revolutions have failed many, many times, of course. So we need to understand in a very clear and sober headed way, the real processes at work and the, the, you know, have the long view of histories so that we can always so we don't get demoralised by this or that setback or, or overawed by some um, temporary change. And the law of quantity and quality helps with that. Uh, before 2008, if you were a Marxist, you would often be considered quite bizarre and um, completely, you know, your ideas were completely discredited. And, you know, you can understand why people thought that. Um, and everything seemed in society, in capitalist society, to be you know, very predictable, um, and basically all the problems had been solved, more or less. Uh, and yet, if you looked underneath the surface, in other words, if you didn't just look at the, if you, the overall quality that was on the surface, but you looked at the inner relations of society by, for example, studying the rate of inequality, which was increasing for year after year after year, or the um, level of indebtedness, for example, um, personal, you know, private and corporate, and also um, state deficits, if you looked at those things, you would begin to see a different picture. You would begin to see that, in other words, contradictions, inner contradictions were developing, and quantitative tensions, you could say, were developing. And of course, this all exploded in the 2008 financial crisis, which people did not foresee. But that event was, if you like, a qualitative rupture, which really has changed human history uh, has changed consciousness and has made Marxism much more obviously relevant to people, although it was always relevant, but it has made it far easier to explain. And and so that's why it's important for this to understand this law and other dialectical laws, but I would particularly emphasise this law for grasping the, pr the process of change in society and for not getting demoralised because at the moment perhaps not very much seems to be happening. Uh, anyway, that concludes our discussion on quantity and quality. Next week, uh, we will be discussing um, another, going into more detail in, in another law of dialectical change, uh, which, is the con which is contradiction and the unity of opposites, which is equally essential to understanding how and why things change. So I'll see you then. Lenin stated that without revolutionary theory, there can be no revolutionary movement. Without a revolutionary theory, we are bound to take in the ideas that surround us. Under capitalism, these are ideas that ultimately defend the status quo. In Wellrad's upcoming book on the history of philosophy, Alan Woods looks at the development of philosophical thinking from the ancient Greeks 
all the way through to Marx and Engels, who brought together the best of previous thinking to produce the Marxist philosophical outlook, which looks at the real material world, not as a static, immovable reality, but one that is constantly changing and moving according to laws that can be discovered. Through this, we can learn how philosophy becomes an indispensable tool in the struggle for the revolutionary transformation of society. Pre-order your copy now at www.marxist.com slash HOP.